All right, hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're gonna to talk about the continental shelf. Last time we talked about the intertidal zone and we talked about how the tides are influenced by the sun and moon. And what we're gonna talk about today is deeper than that. We're gonna move a little bit further offshore and talk about the continental shelf as we go. Now, one of the things that is uh, significant right away with the continental shelf and it kind of depends on the substrate as I'll talk about in a minute, but because you have constant water and wave action, you get turbulence and turbulence stirs up the water and the sediments such that it prevents stratification, meaning that in the continental shelf, the surface and the uh, bottom, the temperature and the salinity kind of stays about the same. There's very little change because the turbulence prevents stratification. And we also say that the continental shelf is primarily made up of, of what we call lithogenous sedimentation, which is sediment from land, meaning that when rocks erode, they flow into the water and they create basically a substrate. So the, the, the ground, if you will, or the um, sediment that is in or on the continental shelf is primarily from the land. And there's different kinds of substrate, as I just mentioned. We're gonna start first with what we call the soft bottom subtidal communities, which are basically like a sandy beach. And we'll talk about the organisms that live there. Okay, so on the continental shelf, starting with the sandy soft bottom types of habitat, uh, we can first look at, there's sort of two different groups of organisms. Those that live on top that we call the epifauna, and then there's those that will burrow in to the sand um, or into the substrate, kind of like when we talked about mud flats, very similar to that kind of habitat in terms of the organisms burrowing in the sand, and we call these the infauna. So we have the epifauna on top and the infauna burrowing into the sand or digging into it. And then based on where those organisms are, there's different kinds of feeding strategies happening. Now, there's a lot of detritus here. and Detritus is dead organic matter that kind of gets moved around in the wave action because of the turbulence and because it's running off shore from rivers and things of that sort. And so many of the organisms here are eating small little tiny bits of dead organisms or detritus. And they do this in two sort of broad ways with some specializations. So first we have what we call suspension feeders uh, that are active suspension feeders. And what this means is they are filter feeders. And so they are actively moving the water and capturing food particles by using either gills of some sort or some kind of movement of their body. They're creating microcurrents and catching little pieces of detritus. But then there's also passive suspension feeders, which are basically just relying on the fact that you have uh, moving water and currents and they're capturing food that way. And that's a passive suspension feeder. Okay, next, if we have areas that have some hard substrate, then we can have organisms like kelp and eelgrass because they're able to anchor onto something and stay in place. So let's talk about kelp forests first that are on the continental shelf. And these are organisms, uh, kelp, a, a wide group uh, of different algae that utilize the ability to have this structure called a hole fast that um, kind of resembles roots in, in, in superficial view if you were just to look at it, but they are not roots because they are unrelated to land plants, but they have this structure called holdfast that help them grip onto substrates. And then they have stipes that are usually long that allow the uh, kelp to sort of reach up towards the surface. And then they have fronds or also they call these blades these are mainly the photosynthetic large portions of the kelp that capture uh, sunlight. And then they have these air bladders, which are sometimes small or sometimes quite large, that are called nematocysts. And you notice it's spelled differently because an N uh, when we're talking about Nigerian. So here we're using it 
in the term we're using it with a P spelled this way because this is an air bladder. It's unrelated to the Nidarian nematocyst. And these allow the um, blades of the kelp to float so that you get this sort of uh, different layering of the kelp forest. And so you can see that the kelp varies depending on the depth and the distance from shore, you get different kinds of kelp and you get different layerings and you get different organisms living in that habitat. Okay, now, if we just look at some, uh, some interesting ecology here, you know, we mentioned before sea otters were hunted nearly to extinction uh, back in the 1800s uh, for their fur, this very, very dense fur, and they did quite well. They were recovering very well. And, and one of the things we noticed when the sea otters were removed is that sea otters, one of the things they eat are sea urchins. And when the sea urchins have no predators, they tend to eat more kelp. They eat the whole vast of the kelp and it floats away. So you lose the whole kelp forest when you have too many sea urchins. Recently, we've noticed a decline in sea otters again. And um, it was kind of shocking because they're, they're protected and why are we losing sea otters now? Well, one of the things that has happened is, I already mentioned uh, the toxoplasma that is affecting sea otters, uh, which is that protozoan uh, single-celled organism that typically is found in cat feces and that is washing into our ocean habitats and that is creating a problem for sea otters. But they're also being eaten by killer whales or orcas, which normally don't eat sea otters, they eat fish. But when the fish populations have declined because of overfishing, the killer whales start eating sea otters. And so that is driving the population of sea otters down once again. And so we're having a problem once again with too many sea urchins and we're losing our kelp forest, which then you lose all the other stuff related to that right there. Now, I want to talk about uh, very quickly here, um, tropical coral reefs. But before I can do that, I need to mention why we have tropical areas in general, if we start with that. So because the earth is round, you have most of the sunlight hitting the equator throughout the year. And because of that, you get a warming of the equator that you don't quite get as you move north and south. And so what ends up happening is warm air rises at the equator, usually between zero degrees and 23.5 degrees north and south. We call that the tropic belt. And that region in there ends up with, in general, the warmer temperatures and typically 12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of darkness per day. And that sets up a, a warm tropical environment, which is where most of these corals thrive. So that gives us then the opportunity to have these tropical coral reefs. And what are the coral reefs? Well, first of all, the reef structure. And the structure is made primarily out of calcium carbonate which comes from a variety of species of coral polyps. And inside the coral, they live with the zooxanthelia are a photosynthetic organism that lives inside, in a form of mutualism, inside the cnidarian. And we call these types of cnidarians that have these zooxanthelia in them that build the structure, we call them the hermatypic type of cnidarian because they secrete calcium carbonate and they build coral reefs. And these organisms do photosynthesis, not the cnidarians themselves, but the zooxanthelia, and that sort of metabolically helps the entire ecosystem. They're the main driving force because of the ability to photosynthesis, which is converting light energy into chemical energy. We've talked about that before. One of the problems is that we get often what is called bleaching of these coral. And bleaching occurs because when you bleach something, you think about it, it turns like white. And maybe we've all accidentally bleached our favorite pair of socks or something like that. And if they weren't white socks, um, then they ended up, you know, not what they were before. And that's called bleaching. And bleaching happens uh, when coral gets either too warm or it gets certain pollutants in it, the zooxanthelia exit the coral and then it ends up making the coral appear 
white, and eventually that ends up killing the coral, and it ends up killing the coral reef, and you're left with nothing but the structure, the dead calcium carbonate structure. Now, we also mentioned fairly recently we've discovered what we call deep water coral, and these are coral polyps that have no zooxanthellae in them, and instead they don't do photosynthesis, but they feed on feed on zooplankton that's floating around inside uh, the turbulent waters, and these are in really deep water. There's no light reaching this particular region, and you'll notice that we drop the word reef from this because the word reef is really a, a nautical term that um, sailors use to navigate things their boat would hit. And so you can still call these deep water coral reefs because structurally they're kind of the same. As you, you never would run into these, they're so deep and they've only been recently discovered. And it turns out they're, they're really big. Um, we know very little about them, but they're much larger in area than the coral reefs they are found all over the world. Okay, and one of the problems with these deep water coral is they're, they've been damaged a great deal by trawling, and trawling occurs when you drag some kind of net or structure across to scrape up the bottom. And we mentioned how uh, humans are uh, fishing and they're catching things, or they're mining, and how we use a variety of methods of getting to the sediments down there and it's not it, it's not easy to do so when we do that we end up getting a whole bunch of stuff and trawling is a major impact for deep water coral and since we're talking now about damage that humans do we call this anthropogenic impacts might as well talk about some other things one of them is called fishing down the food web and uh we, you might have heard about this before but back in the you know, the 70s or so, and before that, we would fish and we would catch large fish. And uh, as those disappeared, we started inventing new ways to capture more fish because it was getting harder to catch fish. And so we developed nets that we, you know, would drag through the ocean. And so instead, when the large fish started disappearing, we kept just fishing down the food web catching smaller and smaller fish, meaning that we're taking away the big fish and all the small ones with it as we go, resulting in a lot of these being what are called bycatch. Bycatch, again, is when you catch things you didn't intend to catch, and they just end up being part of uh, what you just shovel back over. And a lot of what we catch is not intended, it's bycatch, and then they just dump it back into the ocean. Then we also have oil spills happening, um, and the, the, we had one just not too long ago right off our coast here, but we have natural oil seeps that are happening, but then in transporting or the manufacturing of oil, uh, we also have ecological problems that happen that leak that, and then those end up causing problems for wildlife as well. And I think no marine biology class would be complete if you didn't mention what is now called the Great Garbage Patch. In fact, there's at least two of them now. And these are large patches. In fact, they found entire islands now that are just plastic uh, and styrofoam of sorts that are sort of conglomerate conglomerated together into this big pile. And Charles Moore and colleagues in 1997 were the first to discover these. And I remember back uh, early on when I was teaching, uh, we would mention, hey, there's the, this, this great Pacific garbage patch. It's larger than Texas. And that was the, you know, that was the catchy thing at the time. Well, since then, uh, with, with the advent of, with the invention of, you know, people having easy access to getting drones and things like that. So they've been able to monitor this better and get a better idea. And they found that it's way worse and it's a hundred times greater than they thought. And then they've also discovered that a bunch of this they think sinks. And so we have no idea what's on the bottom. So there's, it's a hundred times bigger than we thought originally just with um, the plastics that we knew of on the surface. Um, but then there's also who knows what's on the bottom and, and how much is down there. Now, um, quite often uh, I've been told, like, you know, why am I so depressing? Why I why I tell everybody all these things? And but but today I want to end on a positive note. I want to point out a couple of things about how you can how you can win this game and and make a difference. And it's it's surprisingly easy. So 
The first thing I want to tell you is you have to be aware of what uh, externalities are. And I picked this up uh, from a movie I watched a long time ago um, about climate change. Externalities are things in a business that they don't actually have to pay for the cost. So you don't have to pay to clean up the air or the water or whatever the problem is. You get to maximize more profit because you're trying to make this product to sell. And when you don't have to pay those certain fines or fees for uh, polluting the water or the land or that kind of thing, probably one of the main reasons we can produce things so cheaply in other countries is because of externalities, meaning in the United States, we often have laws that prevent us from doing these ecologically terrible things. But in other places, it's an externality and they don't have to pay for it. So you need to be aware of that, I think in the first place is a good start. The next thing is, this is gonna be real simple for you and you're gonna like this part, but take up, if you don't do it already, take up a sport like surfing and or take up snorkeling or scuba diving or fishing. And you might already do this or get into wave photography. This is actually a friend of mine that lives down by me here, uh, Jeff Bussey, and he is a photographer. He does all kinds of photography, but one of the things he really enjoys doing is taking pictures of waves and he gets hired to take pictures of surfers and things like that all the time. If you have an interest in one of those, then that helps you have a vested interest in protecting your particular resource. So if you want to go fishing or snorkeling or surfing and the beach is a mess and there's a bunch of crap all over it and there's a bunch of problems with it, it will help you see the value of that resource to you. Then you can implement these 10 or more different things and you don't have to do all of them, but pick some of these that are easy for you to do and just be aware of them and mention these to your friends and to your family members because something real simple like you liking surfing or wave photography or whatever it is and then you being aware of how businesses can pass on the buck to somebody else using externalities and then you being aware of say these 10 simple things and you telling people gives a tremendous amount of leverage for you to change what's happening. So the secret to winning is to get lots of people, millions of people to become aware of these simple things and being able to make, I think, changes with almost no effort and having that idea spread is how you win because people don't wanna work that hard. But if it's something easy and it's really simple to do, and it makes what you like to do or what you enjoy better, it's a, it's a win-win. So that's it for now. I hope everybody's having a good day and I will talk with you very soon. Be positive.